Welcome to School of the Bible. School of the Bible is our study of the scriptures that we take 15 minutes to look at 15 scriptures and apply the Holy Spirit in some way, in some manner to you and to me to listen to what he might say to us as we let God apply part of what he is saying to us personally that we can use in our lives, that we can apply to our day-to-day -day existence, that we can somehow see God speaking to us in a way that we understand so that we can follow closely what his plan is as opposed to what we think God might have in store for us. Now, I happen to like the idea that God loves us and that God is love, so that what I do may not completely affect his love, but it does still mean that he may judge me in the end. But thank God and praise the Lord for Jesus, his son, who has given us a means and an opportunity for salvation. I pray you may be saved, and if you're not, I pray you get saved. But what we're studying today is in Nehemiah. We're studying the book of Nehemiah that sometimes is combined with the book of Ezra in some texts. It is the book of Nehemiah 1515, because as I said, we study 15 verses in 15 minutes. So we usually look over at the clock to make sure that we're on target, <laughs> so to speak, because I have run over. But being such that we know God is in control, then I'm sure that he can lead you in a way that you'll understand, even as he applies these words to me, as I understand what he is doing in changing the written word into his own voice, his own will, his own way of revealing to me today what I need for my life. So in verse 1, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, Hach boy, I had to think about that one. It's like the CHs in King James are ch, you know, chet, in Hakaliah. And it came to pass in the month of Huslu, in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the palace, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came, and he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, The remnant that are in left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. And it came to pass, when I heard these words, that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted, and prayed unto the God of heaven, and said, I beseech you, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe to do his commandments. Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before you now day and night for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which have, which we have sinned against you. Both I and my father's house have sinned. We have dealt very corruptly against you, and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments, which you have commanded your servant Moses. Remember, I beseech you, the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If you transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. But if you turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, though they were of you cast out unto the uttermost parts of the heaven, yet will I gather them from thence, and will bring thee and them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. Now, these are thy servants and thy people, whom thou hast redeemed by great power and by thy strong hand. O Lord, I beseech you, that now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servants, and to the prayer of thy servants, who desire to fear your name, and prosper, I pray thee, thy servant this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I am the king's cupbearer. And it came to pass, in the month of Nisan, the twentieth year of Artaxerxes the king, that was, that wine was before him, and I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I had not been aforetime sad in his presence. 
Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very sore afraid, and said unto the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad, when the city, the place of my father's sepulchres, lieth waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. Interestingly enough, we see so many people pray the prayer of Daniel. We see people say the prayer of Jabez. We don't really hear a lot about people praying like Nebuch or Nehemiah. We don't hear a lot of people praying like Ezra or Solomon. Interestingly enough, we do hear that Nehemiah here is confessing his sin and the sin of the people and the nation and the people and the judges and all of it. He's not leaving anything out. He's confessing that we blew it. We screwed up. We are guilty. Now, I like the idea that, you know, in other administrations of the presidency of the United States of America, people have said the buck stops here. Most presidents don't do that. They blame and hire people to take what's called plausible responsibility, plausible accountability, plausible deniability. They're able to say, oh, I didn't know, when they did know. They're able to say, well, this is what I mean, not what I said. They're able to do a lot of things. But in these days, as you see with Nehemiah standing before the king, he can't lie. If he does, the king knows. The king sees right through him and says, toast. Because if he couldn't trust the word the man was saying, he would not want that person close to him. And that's what it is with today's society. You know, when we have a president that has to have certain people speak for him, speak about him, and he keeps them around him. Right now, people are arguing about all the leaks that are coming out of the administration because it's telling us the truth about what's going on as opposed to the lies about what is supposedly going on. But I find this interesting in Nehemiah is that Nehemiah writes actual factual statements about what went on in the king's presence. He wasn't afraid to tell the truth. He just spoke it like it is, the way it is, such as it is. Let the chips fly where they may. He called a spade a spade, and he called the children of Israel sinful. We did it. I did it. My house did it. The country did it. The leaders did it. We all were guilty. I wonder if we would be so bold when we stand before God to have told everything we have done, the good and the bad. You see, it's not that we're supposed to have one outweigh the other. It's just supposed to be that we recognize that in us there dwells no good thing. That we are corrupt, we are evil, we are sinful flesh. A lot of people like to say that babies are innocent, and they're really not. I mean, I'm not big on babies, so you know you may think that I'm prejudicial, but no, I'm big on God and what he says. God says, hey, I'll save whom I save, and I'll spare whom I'll spare, I'll have mercy on whom I have mercy. So there may be some babies that get to heaven, but to put it bluntly, all babies do not go to heaven any more than all souls go to heaven simply because they don't know God. They do. The fact is God knows things before they happen, whether a person would or would not accept Jesus. So the fact that a baby you think is born innocent, the Bible says is born in sin, conceived in sin, and will die in sin unless they are saved by literally Jesus. Now, the fact is you could pray for a baby. You could pray and God could save a baby. We have a lot of examples of people praying for committing their children unto God and God taking them. We could advocate for a lot of people saying that some babies are saved, which I can agree with that. But I can't agree with any evangelical pastor who stands up and says, your baby's going to heaven and he's going to grow up while he's in heaven. I can't go with that because the Bible doesn't say so. The Bible has never said that and will not say that and is not any way, shape, or form available to any pastor lying to a woman who has lost a baby simply trying to make her feel good. It doesn't work that way. God is love. God knows best. We leave it in his hands. When the 
TV program was Our Father Knows Best, it was cute. But really, my father knows best. He knows which babies might go to heaven and which babies aren't going to heaven no matter what you do. Because I'm sorry, but, you know, there's a whole new teaching out that, uh, hey, just, you know, if you can't handle your baby, kill it. It'll go to heaven even if you don't. And there are people that have done it, thinking their babies are going to heaven. I got news for you. It don't work that way. There is no such thing as salvation by murder. doesn't work. No one can teach it, no one can preach it, and no one can imply it. God is just. Man is not. So we find ourselves looking at Nehemiah, knowing full well that, hey, you know, we've got a problem here. And I just wanted to know what was going on because I did not realize that there were so many problems with my people in a faraway land, my refugees that are stuck back in Israel, my people that I'm a refugee, but I need to help out my people back at home because I'm the one that's at sin. I'm the one that's in sin. I'm the one that can make a difference. I'm the one that though I am a sinner, I can change the course of history by recognizing that God is the one I've sinned against, not man. Not my own nation, not the laws of the land, but God is the one I am accountable to. God is the one that I will ask forgiveness from. God is the one I will pray that he does something for my people that are desperate and destitute in the land. Now, Israel today is not desperate or destitute. I got news for you. You don't need to send them any money. They got more money they know what to do with, and they keep telling you know everybody, hey, we don't need your money. They'll take it, but they'll, you know... They pretty much wealthy as a nation. But the fact of the matter that there are refugees in the world that are in need, that we should recognize that Nehemiah found out that his own people were like refugees living in the land as refugees, even though it was their land, their city, their nation. But they were refugees because it was controlled by Artaxerxes. The people of the land, as we'll find out later, are treating their own people like refugees. And we have refugees in America today that are refugees. We call them street people. We call them the mental health people that we don't know what to do with them, so we put them out on the street. We call them drug addicts. Since we don't know how to get them fixed, we're going to fix the, so so we're going to fix the problem by keeping them on the street. We don't know how to deal with homelessness. We don't know how to deal with helplessness. We don't know how to deal with the normal nature of man in sin. But Nehemiah does. Nehemiah says, I know what I'll do. I'll go to God. And so he does. He prayed. Now we're going to find out later that, you know, the king notices that he prayed. The king notices that he went through all this stuff. But he wants to hear Nehemiah say it. Because nothing happens in a kingdom without the king knowing it. Believe me. They are, in this point in time in history, very aware of anything happening in their own administration. In their own cabinet in their own White House. But Nehemiah is still moved to tell the truth, to admit the facts, to say unto the king what is bothering him. Now, I happen to have the opportunity to, every day to go on the Internet and to preach and teach and to share with the people what I care about when I've asked God, do I dare to share about? And God says, yes, tell them this. So I tell people that, and some of them think I'm mad or upset and angry? I go, no. I'm just reminding you that this is what we do as Christians. We don't become political. We are about and involved in around people that are political. But Nehemiah was a cupbearer. He was not a politician. He was serving as a slave to a king, not as a counselor to an administration. Remember that, because God is going to use him in a mighty way. We already know by way of Ezra that a decree went forth, but how did it accomplish? How did it happen? When did it happen? And what were all the pieces involved in it? The book of Nehemiah gives us more of an insight into that. So in your life, don't be surprised if you find yourself concerned about things other than yourself. People other than who you are. People that maybe they are desperate, or maybe they are homeless or helpless or in a city without walls and gates, or being oppressed, and that you have to do something about it. 
that you feel compelled to do something about it, that you want to do something about it, and then you pray and then God makes you act in a certain way. And that's what's happened to Nehemiah. He prayed and now God is going to call him on the carpet. Are you willing to make the king know what you're concerned about? And that's where I have to ask you, do you really care? If you care about the country, don't just sit back and say, well, that's the way it goes. No, pray. And then do what God says, not what you say. Don't get involved in politics in the way that, you know, you vote and you get involved in 20, you know, every two years having to be part of some political maneuverings and then listen to some pastor tell you why you should vote and how you should vote and what you should do. No, you want to change the world. All you got to do is pray first, do what God says second, and God will do the rest. That's how it works. And we'll see here in Nehemiah, that's what God is teaching us. Not to be so advocate of doing, but more of listening to what God says to do, and then only acting as God tells us to do, not as any man, political action committee, CPAC, or Democratic Party, or anyone else would tell us to do, but rather listen to what God tells you personally.